Welcome to the Nerds and Friends podcast. Today we have author Danny Hoops joining myself and author, artist Will Shaw. Very excited to talk to you today, Danny. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, so for our audience, you are the author of over two dozen books that all have awesome covers and really cool premises. And it seems like they're mostly sci-fi or fantasy adventure stories. And so let's dive in there. Like what made you want to be a writer? Let's kind of start there and go from there. Um, I've always just loved writing stories, making up stories. Like I found one from fourth or fifth grade because my parents moved. And so like, here's all the rest of your stuff that I left and told me how to get rid of. And I'm like, oh, okay. I was writing stories way back when, and they're still the same premise and I have a thing for bad guys. Okay. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> That's awesome. Bad guys are always the most fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was just like, oh, cool. It's just never changed. <laughs> well, you know, when you, you, when you hit your stride and you, you're doing what you love, like why, why fix what's not broken? That's true. <laughs> Write what you love. Exactly. Well, and it, it looks like your most recent story that's uh, come out is The Return. And that's book three in a, a series, correct? Actually, it was Retribution. Oh, City of Cows, Retribution. Yeah, City of Cows. Yes. When um, you said swashbuckling LGBTQ plus adventure, I was like, okay, I'm on board immediately. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Yeah, a lot of reviewers said it's like Firefly, but make it gay. It's like, yes. <laughs> It's like Firefly, but take out the Joss Whedon and we're good. <laughs> good to go. Well, that, that is quite the pitch there. Yes, th that's fantastic. Does, does it have much space um, exploration? They go to the moon, but that's about it. Uh, but mm -hmm. it's still got that sci-fi mixed with Western. So you got that big dramatic difference in technology between different cities and towns. And wow, that's cool. <laughs> That's really fun to explore. What, what is your process for world building when you're kind of building out, you know, a totally fictional world like that? Like, what's kind of your process there? I'm trying to draw a rudimental um, map. The <laughs> mind just like end up always being square, like Animal Crossing or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And then uh, like I make the creatures and kind of think of what like technology they're at and like their animals and how they go about their daily stuff and their military they kind of just start there that's awesome yeah focusing on kind of their day-to-day -day kind of helps get their yeah. get their vibe and everything that's really cool and then like 90 percent of it's not in the book but <laughs> yeah, that's, yay yeah. world building <laughs> yay. <laughs> <laughs> yep well, that's why you have uh, you get to release the the dictionary of the world of book later on, That'd be cool. <laughs> where it's just like all of your incoherent notes just uh, released to the public for them to uh, like scrounge through Samarillion style. Yes. Yeah, go the Tolkien route. Around. Yeah. <laughs> That's when awesome. all these encyclopedias uh my friend and i or mm -hmm. co-author and i are like working on a book but like it's so much different than when it's just you because it's like oh it's in my head i can just write this note and i know what i mean usually mm -hmm. but then with the co-authors like trying to get into each other's head <laughs> yeah. understanding, it's really been an interesting process but we're both kind of like it's on not the back burner but not like what we need to focus on <laughs> both in our yeah career. So how does that work collaborating when you're like trying to, to use shorthand? You ever just get notes like, it's the cheese. What does that mean? <laughs> uh, we have not been doing shorthand. <laughs> it's always like really, he's really good at making a lot of detail, which I, it's great. Like he made this, he has his, he's been working on it for a long time. So I'm like helping him finish it, mm. but like tweak it. And it's changed a lot, but so he has like the full book. But then he like made an outline, but like the outline's like a miniature book. And I'm like, mm -hmm. so you might write in too much. I'm like, no, this actually helps because then I can find stuff easier. But then like I'm making the shorthand, <laughs> like one sentence. Okay. So mm -hmm. I know, because that's how I think is like short. I can't deal with that much information at once. No, it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So what got you into sci-fi originally? Um, I grew up like reading Foundation, Isaac yes. Asimov, and then- I have uh, that book right over there. <laughs> and then I also like always love Star Wars. Like I don't remember watching any movie other than like Disney movies. 
at a young age other than I guess Disney's you know and Star Wars yeah. but not back then. retroactively <laughs> it's all big, you know <laughs> so I just always love like, like, um, and then I also was originally going into astrophysics for a career but then I didn't do that so. wow <laughs> Yeah, I like to keep my science interest. Uh, I like to keep it amateur at that level. It's more fun that way <laughs> when it you're not getting seems, paid for it. Yeah. It just seems stressful. And I was like, I don't want to be that stressed. So I became an author because, you know. <laughs> not stressful not at all. No. <laughs> no, creative field, very low stress, you know, no deadlines, no uh, <laughs> people breathing down your neck to actually get something done. Never ever need procrastination. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I have deadlines. Like I made two deadlines on Monday, and I was like, "Why did I do this?" Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> so, what's mm-hmm. been your biggest challenge as an author? Like, what's been the most challenging aspect of it? I know for me, it's been like marketing my books once I finish it. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize you don't just write the book; you got to market. You you need all that. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> marketing <laughs> is definitely really hard, but also like not looking at reviews is also really hard. <laughs> yes. I've been good. I have not looked at reviews this whole year. Nice, that's awesome. Unless I had to like look up, but then I just click, you know, the five and four star for like quotes and stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I still see like what the average is, but <laughs> yeah, it's looking good. That's actually kind of an interesting, uh, an interesting point. What's that like trying to get like, get feedback or interaction with your uh with your readers there because you got to imagine like when you're actually writing the isolation that you have to have from the audience in order to like create this work and then not wanting to just like get bogged down in in reviews but I'm, I'm sure you want to get some feedback yeah. or have some interaction there so what is that like trying to like interact with your fans or your uh, your readers? Um, I, I use some beta readers and that's how I kind of get feedback and my husband reads it and gives me feedback and he'll give me honest feedback. <laughs> and then it's like, why do you say that now? Yeah, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I have to go, okay, he's helping. <laughs> it's like people you know that give you feedback, you get angrier mm-hmm. than like people you don't know. <laughs> Like yeah. from a stranger, I'm like, oh, I get it. But when it's from yeah, a friend, yeah. I'm like, you're just being biased. Like you don't get it. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> um, being part of writing groups definitely helps to get some critique. Uh, but just with reviews, because mm-hmm. I, I definitely understand people wanting to look at the reviews so they can improve. But sometimes they're just they're nasty, and if that like messes with your mind, then you just you mm-hmm. don't. In order to keep writing and not feel like you. <laughs> You yeah. suck. You don't read those reviews. Uh, but then this, you know, people who do email me and say, you know, I love this and this, and then they'll critique a little, or like fellow authors who review my book, I'll mm-hmm. read their reviews because, yeah, usually, you know, they usually don't name it all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're not because they know, you know, you're not, they're also an author. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's got to be nice uh, if you have like a community of authors because then you also, have a reference of this is somebody else who knows what they're doing at least with uh with writing hopefully yeah <laughs> Usually. I mean, ideally <laughs> yeah i highly recommend finding like your critique group and uh, actually also if, for marketing um like a local group that has published books because then you can go to bookstores and like pitch yourselves as a collective for like signings and stuff because that's, that's a great where I, idea yeah, everyone um, is always wondering how Danny, how you have so many books in Barnes and Noble around Phoenix anyway, and you're doing so many signings. I'm like, because we're part of a collective, and like you pitch it, you do all the work for the bookstore. You know, they're. I mean, they still can say no, but like if they don't have to do the marketing, like you make, I make all the marketing materials for our signings, and then like, you know, we'll show up. We'll, well, some of them do consignment, some of them will order the book and stuff. The less work for the store, the better, and then more people mm. means more audience. So that's yeah. a good idea. I just moved to Colorado, so I want to start getting plugged in doing that locally. So that's that's a really good idea. Yeah, Colorado definitely will have a space for that. <laughs> yep. 
So, so what's some other advice that you would give to like, we have a lot of listeners on the podcast who are like aspiring authors or like, you know, first time authors, what's kind of some advice or tips or tricks you would give to people writing their first book or looking to start writing their first book? Um, I highly recommend uh, like for writing to keep writing each chapter and not stop and edit, like finish the entire book. It doesn't have to be in order, whatever order you want to do it. Cause I know some people who are like, oh, I want to write this chapter or just one character point of view and then go in and fill it the other. So I sometimes do that, mm-hmm. um, but you can't edit something that's not finished. So if you change something drastically, just put a note, you know, that's what my, all my mentors said. And I'm like, that helped a lot to just be cranking out books and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I got to imagine if you're if you finish the first book, then you, you also have the advantage when you if you go back and edit it of knowing how the book ends. Yeah, there's that, too. <laughs> yeah. That's how, that's how I end up like uh, how I know a story is that, you know, the beginning or where I want to start the beginning. But knowing the end is always the best. For me. Mm-hmm. And the characters just kind of go all over. But then because <laughs> I, I plot, but then they just do mm-hmm. whatever they want. Yep. Like as long as you get to where I'm going, I'm okay. Mm-hmm. Just don't change that. It's like a Dungeons and Dragons campaign. You'll have like a lower yes, endpoint, like and that. you're like, my players will kind of meander, but I'll get them to that one, one endpoint eventually throughout the session. So <laughs> yeah, that's what I feel like. I'm like, is this what our DM feels like? <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. They're just doing whatever they want. Like yeah. one one time for D and D, they had Dino Racing. And then the characters were all like, we want to do dino racing. And so like, that was a whole, he's like, okay, well, I expected to be over here today, but I guess we're just dino racing. We're just dino racing. Me and Will were in a game once where uh, our DM created a uh, skiing in the fantasy world. And so of course our characters went <laughs> skiing and made it a whole big thing. So that was fun. <laughs> yeah. This was I, like just two minutes of, of our game and that ended up being the whole session of just <laughs> we called it slip falling was the fantasy name for skiing <laughs> we um i'm a bard and my friend is a rogue and we're kind of like partners in theirs nice. and um we ended up with a ghost or like something like that a ghost in it <laughs> and the rest of the uh, members forgot so we're using the ghost to go in houses and see who's not home so we could go and steal stuff. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> and like awesome. each town we were doing it for a while. <laughs> it was really fun. It's like like completely forgot. Yeah. But no. That's fantastic. Now they remember, but <laughs> <laughs> that's delightful. <laughs> Yeah. What's what's been the most rewarding part of putting out so many books and like I mean you have over two dozen books like you're like a really accomplished author that's so cool like what's been the most rewarding part of the journey? Uh, like getting them in the mail and holding them is always like awesome. Like I wrote this, yeah. you can see them in bookstores. It was one of the funnest thing was um, a friend I hadn't heard for from for a while because you know COVID you just. Mm-hmm. Uh, like text me out of the blue is like this is your book at the store <laughs> oh, that's, <laughs> cool. uh, that's got to be the best feeling in the while. world oh that's so cool um, and then giving them to like my mentors I'm like <laughs> yeah here you go oh that's so cool all right i was like did i send that one out too okay <laughs> you're like what, did I? <laughs> the one book i wrote during a writing mentorship um came out january 2020 and mm-hmm. I like text my mentor. He's like, "Want me to send it to you, or do you bring it to Comic Con in May?" And they're like, "Oh, bring Comic Con." But then oh. you know, COVID happened. Yeah. So two years later, I'm like, "Here you go." <laughs> <laughs> Have you gone to a Comic Con yet to promote your books? Yeah, I went to Phoenix um, a month ago ish. Oh, nice. Um, we did really well. It was pretty amazing. Because um, like when I started out, I was going to cons, but I didn't sell as many. And mm-hmm. I, um, but I didn't have as good covers. Like I redid my covers during COVID and just oh, nice. focused on marketing. Mm, nice. um, so like, like had like a goal and like beat that goal and like paid for the booth is always the goal. Yes. And then I actually like paid for all the stuff I bought there. <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, that's a plus. That's huge. Yeah. <laughs> Cause yeah, money can fly away from you at a con for sure. Yes, There's so much cool stuff. That's pretty good, but like I, I always end up wanting to buy commissions and stuff. Yeah. 
I get to be a lot. Yeah, well, I'll be taking my two books that I've written to my first con in August, so I'm excited. So I was excited to hear that it went well for you. That's really yeah. cool. Wait, which yeah. con did you go to? Are you? Well, going no, I'll, to? I'll be going to Colorado Springs Comic Con. Okay. Yeah. So and I looked at the the booths are pretty affordable, and I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. So. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of of covers, what's your process for getting your cover done? Out of curiosity. Um, I go through Viserca Designs off 99 Designs. Um, I usually make a Pinterest board for like the, the series and mm -hmm. then kind of tell her what I want, what the characters like, what they look like. Um, and then we go from there. And usually there's not much to change. Like they're really good. They're, there's a couple that I'm like, oh, you know, like that, but uh, or make it. Because sometimes with the cover, especially because most of my books are YA, they kind of look older. Because <laughs> it's hard to find, you know, models and stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, I usually make a Pinterest board um, with the City of Cows books. I went through a different artist that I saw. Can't remember what book it was. It was like a spinoff of <laughs> Wizard of Oz, but I can't remember. Um, but I really liked her style and ended up using her for City Cows, but, and then taking that art and then having my normal cover artist do like the, the title and stuff. Cause she didn't know how to, she didn't do, she's like, I don't do fine. I'm like, okay, well, I'm not going to ruin it. Uh, but then the artist Mona, her name is Mona Finden. She, I think it's pronounced her name. Um, she's actually doing the cover art for the Firefly book or comics. Oh, what? The covers. And I was like, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> oh, and I'm that's seeing so her cool. stuff more and more on white, like uh, traditional published way. So it's pretty cool. Like, mm -hmm. yay. <laughs> oh, that's neat. That's awesome. Like, someone yeah. looked at it and thought the same thing as me. <laughs> <laughs> Be good for Firefly. That's yeah. awesome. That is. So, kind of. Going back to, to an earlier point, you said that you, you like to plot out the books. Um, so uh, when you are doing a series, because uh, you said that the uh, your latest book was the third in, in a series, right? The second. The second. I, yeah, because I'm finishing the third tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow. Well. Tomorrow. Do <laughs> <Yeah>, Monday. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> awesome. That's well, exciting. Yeah. Well, so when you are plotting how far ahead do you plot do you plot just for like the volume that you're working on or do you try to plot for the entire series up front or like what's kind of your process there i usually get an idea for like how many books it'll be and like mm -hmm. generally where each one needs to start and end but like kind of the middle is kind of fuzzy um mm -hmm. when i start the book then i'll like flesh it out ish and then the characters do whatever they want and ignore that. <laughs> Just been the last couple of weeks, me going. <laughs> um, but usually I do know like where it's headed because otherwise I feel lost and I like don't know at all where they're going. Like, mm -hmm. If I know where they need to go, at least feel safe and secure. But actually, I totally forgot um, the artist for City of Cows, she did want a summary of each book. So I actually did have to think it out. Nice. Wow. Um, like just a small one I'm like oh these are done <laughs> yay that's good she asked for that i mean so she has context for every element of the cover you know yeah and then she's like I'm like hey someone forced me to do the outline <laughs> <laughs> that's I'm awesome like, this is not great but or not like a really nice outline but at least she, yeah we both knew where to go i'm excited mm -hmm. to like do a cover reveal for book four and five because i like them the most <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. They're not out yet. <laughs> yeah, I remember when I published my first book, I remember I was so excited. And then they were like, type out a summary of what your book's about, one to two sentences. And I was like, ah, yeah, <laughs> that part's hard. <laughs> you know? Blurbs are yeah. the hardest. And the blurbs for the serial, like the next books are the hardest because like you don't want to give anything away, but you kind of like you're going to. Yeah. Oh, like that's a one. hard line to cross. Yeah, it is. I usually wait until like the the book before it's out before I actually do do a description, just so like someone doesn't go, oh, there's a new book. What? Oh, and I just got spoiled that for the book that's not out yet. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I kind of like wait a couple of weeks after. 
and then I'll, yeah. I'll like, otherwise it says more de description coming soon. That's, why I'll, that's, <laughs> that's a good tip to description coming soon and just let it let it be yeah. for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. That is always the, the trick of like you you need to give the audience enough that they're gonna that they're interested in reading the book, but you don't want to go like telling them everything where like, oh, I've already read this entire book now from this like two paragraph cover. Yeah. Yeah. And you want them to at least understand what it is about <laughs> and not just like mm -hmm. all over yeah. the place. I highly recommend um, just focusing on one character in the descriptions, whatever I've been told, uh -huh. even if you have multiple characters, kind of like pinpointing it and not too many names. Otherwise people are like, and then always have a question at the end because then people want to like, what's the answer? Oh, that's a good tip. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I might that be wrong, but <laughs> what i've been told no that makes sense i mean if there's a question of like will they or won't they you're like well i want to find out now yeah. so okay i don't know will they <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's awesome well tell us about uh like the main character for the uh, city of uh, faust books i'm curious what the protagonist is like for that series mm -hmm. so um for that one ellie is uh with her best friend zach and they are searching for her ex-fiance because they think he has something to do with the destruction of their own, uh, their uh, own kind. Mm -hmm. um, so like someone destroyed their entire city has just been obliterated. There's not many of them left and she's taken out on her ex-fiance because he ran away right when it happened. Uh, suspicious. Then, yeah. Mm, what you find out more and more about the truth. What really happened? Mm. That sounds enticing. That's cool. So it's kind of like there's aliens, but they're not technically aliens because aliens means from somewhere. I guess no, it doesn't. It's still aliens. Yeah. Not saying it's aliens, but it's aliens. But it's aliens. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. So when, when, when you are, because uh, like you were saying earlier that, that you do let your characters kind of be the drivers of the story of... Uh, how much of that fighting do you have to end up doing like in your head with the the different characters there to actually keep them on track like do you ever run into points where like you're trying to write something and the characters are just like nope that's not how this is going to happen um i think there's too many books <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think like I'm open for change, so I've never had to like really change what they're doing, which just sounds weird because they're in my head. But because <laughs> <laughs> um, like looking, I don't, I can't find like the first draft of the quest, but I know that one of the main characters, well, not main characters, but like important secondary characters in it was not a secondary character. Like it was just like one, like, oh, we talked in one chapter and that was it. But he's like, no. And it's always the cocky characters that'll stay in the <laughs> and decide, no, we're doing this. And I'm in here the entire time. I'm like, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, that happened in Daughter of Hades, too. When you stop writing cocky characters, because you get too many, too many Han Solos <laughs> coming in and being like, I'm yes. doing thing. <laughs> it, the, the quest is, is more like Gambit. <laughs> <laughs> oh nice <laughs> and then you know i like gambit i was like oh i'll keep you yeah <laughs> that's awesome just sitting there as the writer just sitting there okay you're the boss okay <laughs> keep writing <laughs> got a, i've got a cat scratching my door so i'm gonna let him in real quick i'll be right back <laughs> <laughs> i know that feeling i'm surprised mine didn't come so what are but your as, other oh huh? go ahead but as for like Mm -hmm. them actually taking over where I, so much where I don't like mm -hmm. it I haven't quite had that the villain was cut oh, <laughs> the villain was causing problems but it, it ended up fine and it changed my ending but that's okay mm -hmm. it didn't change it where it, it I won't I won't give it away but it just changed it a bit but not what I'm gonna do with it yeah sometimes those are the best stories where you you do end up like you let the story kind of evolve with the characters instead of just trying to force your initial vision. 
And and if anyone says, I saw that coming, I'd be like, well, I didn't. So I don't know <laughs> how you just saw that coming. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you got lucky because I wrote the story and I did not see it coming. <laughs> I know some authors are like that. Oh, yeah, that's why you were like hinting at it here. Yeah, I thought that far ahead. <laughs> mm-hmm. yes. Like, exactly. exactly. Yes, you see. It makes you wonder for all the, the stuff um, we read in like high, you know, middle school and high school. Oh, the author was doing this element and all this. And it's like, mm-hmm. become an author. I'm like, really? Were they? Because <laughs> I feel like it's not. Yeah. Having yeah. to write like an analytical essay, you're like, eh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, go when we finally end up making a time machine we go back and Tolkien was just like I have no idea what is happening with him <laughs> I was just telling a story yeah I guess it does kind of follow that <laughs> <laughs> I guess that is a theme there yeah, yeah I never noticed my themes until mm-hmm. I'm writing I'm like oh that's kind of a theme mm-hmm. not what I was thinking like when I like plotted it but yeah I guess it's... yeah well uh, Sorry, my cat's being extra needy right now. I apologize <laughs> for being distracted. Cats no. <laughs> yeah, a little horror is like, you're busy. I'm going to distract you now. <laughs> yeah. They're like, this is my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Haru and um, friends. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask, as far as theme, like, do you ever, like, try to, to push, like, a specific theme or a specific idea from the start? Or do you... Is, that always something that you just let develop there i kind of let develop um i i definitely do a lot of found family and i've noticed that and always go tend towards that so i I know that going in that i'll end up being found family almost every single time um but as for like other stuff it usually just comes up and then there'll be like this paragraph like Mm -hmm. oh yeah this is a cool theme like they 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 come i don't know the best word um but just like the differences because mm-hmm. the city of cows kind of follows a little bit well now but also like victorian big differences between people who had mm-hmm. money and like poor people and that's kind of the, also the who has access to high tech and you know not mm-hmm. and so that kind of became a theme and then you know like facing right. that now and so it's like yeah. it wasn't on purpose but that's kind of how the world building of wild west is in general yeah. and star yeah. wars too I do notice that a lot in in um, like LGBTQ fiction where uh, you have those found family themes and I'm wondering if that is just kind of like a part of the cultural zeitgeist there or if that's just such a, a common narrative of, of like people under 40 where we've just kind of the world that we live in has just kind of led us to uh, having a lot of different uh, found families yeah I definitely probably both I would say because my starting out books aren't LGBT and they still have the found family and it's kind of that any yeah anyone under like 40 has the idea of family has changed I felt like since mm-hmm. the 80s and 90s and definitely um, college and <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. friends leaving home uh yeah. yeah, it's definitely an LGBT as well, just because family. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think there's there's so many like old associations that just aren't as powerful anymore because yeah. people don't really resonate with them. And so we're finding our own and making our own that really have meaning to us. And that's a really beautiful thing. So mm-hmm. that's really cool. Yeah. For sure. That's awesome. No, I, feel, I see how that's a theme that really resonates with people. So it makes mm-hmm. sense that it would be an undercurrent of many stories, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I don't know really. I, I think a lot of books these now are found family. I'm like now yeah. realizing my second book kind of has that as a theme. I didn't <laughs> even realize it. I'm like, oh yeah, the characters now, all do come together and become a family kind of. <laughs> now I kind of want to think about it and like look at authors who are above and below 40 and how Ooh. they have their friends and family units. Interesting. It's like YA definitely, but then if I think of like Timothy Zahn or, or you know, Isaac Asimov, they're a little, I don't, they're usually like singular and not really like a found family. Like they usually have like a duo, but not yeah. like mm-hmm. 
Hmm. <laughs> just a lot of like a lot of YA fiction in general does kind of have that kind of have that kind of theming just because I feel like when when you're like in those teenage years uh you are trying to separate yourself out from like your parents and like the family you grew up with and find your own identity so I definitely think that that kind of pushes uh, a lot of uh, a lot of fiction targeting that audience into that direction but yeah even like when you're you are talking about like other non YA uh, authors and hmm. you know now I need to like go through books and think about it like, is yeah it? I'm gonna conduct a double blind study here and <laughs> that'll be one of our new podcasts like uh uh things we'll do like a uh, literary analysis that will be cool <laughs> yeah analyzing themes based on age of authors <laughs> yeah. none of us are literary majors but we can all put on glasses so we can uh... i'm already wearing them <laughs> yes i have some around here somewhere <laughs> we had to read for i did take like some creative writing classes and in reading classes we read uh ray bradbury and stephen king and now i'm like did either of them have anything ray bradbury had quite a few destruction of the family but <laughs> i can't think of any like found family things there yeah. ray bradbury had some very scary stories oh yeah <laughs> realize how scary he was <laughs> And like the beauty of, of Ray Bradbury is just like, it, it's not horror in the traditional sense. Like yeah. you're not sitting there just like afraid to read the next page, but after you finish reading about it and then you think about it, it's <laughs> like, oh my God, that is absolutely horrific. Yeah. It's like, now I'll never eat mushrooms again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But Stephen King did that sometimes too. And like that he has like some story with the guy who was like drinking lots of beer and became like this monster because like the beer was contaminated with stuff mm. which was funny because like the character's name in there was Richie and then my neighbor was named Richie and he was like always drinking beer and I'm like <laughs> yeah. oh no <laughs> coincidence <laughs> not that's awesome so what's um like so you've mentioned uh timothy zahn and ray bradbury and isaac asimov what are some other authors that have really like impacted your work or that you really want to like kind of either emulate or take their themes and like evolve them to a new level i definitely like kevin j anderson he writes family <laughs> nice <laughs> okay i had to think about that okay. um kevin j anderson uh and Michael Stackpole, though, he writes more fantasy. Nice. Um, mm -hmm. Those are kind of my, like, aspiring authors. Uh, mm -hmm. I lost my train of thought. <laughs> uh, Karen McManus, like, her, have you guys read any of her books? I have not, no. Not familiar her, with her, no. She writes YA Dark Academia, like, thriller. Ooh. But she writes, in the, and so, like, she has a few books out, and they're all see, mostly, um, just like individual like not a serial oh. series mm -hmm. but they're still so entertaining and like you just keep wanting to read and like the characters might start out like maybe not bland but like oh you know where this is going but then like she evol evolves the characters like so well and like I want to like I need to read more of her stuff to like get that wow like mm -hmm. I want characterization like this this is amazing <laughs> like Especially for like if I'm doing more high school stuff versus fantasy or sci-fi world. Um like Joanna Ruth Meyer does intertwines fantasy elements like really, really well. And like her language is beautiful. Oh, that's cool. So stuff like that. You can learn something from any book you read, <laughs> definitely, that's whether a good it be point. good or bad. That's <laughs> a good why point. You don't like this or why you like something. Yeah, that is all, always a fascinating thing of just how how much influence you end up picking up from just 
even if it's just minor things from just everything that you end up experiencing, even if it's completely separate medium from uh, from what you're doing. Yeah, for sure. Like I um, have a degree in anthropology and urban planning. Mm-hmm. I don't like use them, but I'm like, but I do. I use them constantly, like world building, urban planning. I understand like city structures. Oh, that's cool. Anthropology. And then I also do like use them for, um, cause I write, I summarize botanic, mostly botanical medicinal uh, articles for American Botanical Council, but some of them are like anthropology based. Oh, wow. I'm using it. Why do you guys keep saying I'm not? I'm <laughs> Yeah. That's, that's a cool knowledge to have of like how cities are laid out and like the logic and the infrastructure and the reasoning behind everything like that. I find that really fascinating. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's it's fascinating and then you know saddening at the same time. Yeah, <laughs> just like how fragile it is, like the infrastructure and everything. Well, more like things that could be done but don't because oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, politics for so, everything. <laughs> we're kind of like you know Anakin episode two says you know. We need a dictatorship, but not someone needs to make them all of the same. <laughs> I'm not saying we should have a dictatorship, but we had to like write an art. We had to write an essay in the test of what kind of government is best for planning. I'm like, well, technically speaking, <laughs> dictatorship would get stuff done. It just might not be right because you know, like it depends on yeah. one person instead of a collective. But the, but they would get stuff done. There's only been like one person who had that power that actually got good things done. I cannot, for the life of me, remember who it was. Someone in South America, he got like all this beautiful uh, public transit. Can't lie. But democracy is good, but I'm just saying. Oh. <laughs> no, I know exactly who you're talking about now. And I'm like, I'm spacing out on their name. Oh, I need way more coffee today. I cannot, like, it was funny because when my cohort people messaged me like last year he's like do you remember the name I'm like no it's been bugging me for years <laughs> i don't want to deep dive because then i'll get distracted yeah problem is you're gonna wake you're gonna remember it you're gonna wake up at 3 a.m and be like that's who it is and then you're gonna fall back to sleep and completely forget again <laughs> that's how it works <laughs> well, this has been a super fun interview thank you so much for your time yeah. danny it was great talking to you and look forward to reading your books especially the city of Kaus series looks really really fun so yeah, the firefly plan me. i'm like i want to read those now that sounds really cool so. and check out the firefly with the art by her <laughs> yeah that's yeah. so cool that is yeah I, I didn't realize that uh like that was even an option to get the same person yeah like yeah, it's interesting it's definitely expensive <laughs> but yeah it's, it depends their schedule too because some of them are booked that way and she was booked okay. out a few months in advance um but i got them like all done a couple years ago um but yeah you can you just have to have enough money <laughs> yeah and the right timing <laughs> and the right timing and <laughs> That's, That's the thing. Awesome. You can get any artist if you can yeah. afford to pay them. Yes. We Same are... for the voice actors. Yep. yep. Yeah. Well, this was awesome. Thank you so much for being on Nerds and Friends. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. Of course. <laughs>